Thank you, Jason, for that very nice introduction. And where are you in your PhD studies, by the way? <laughs> OK. I'm, it's a real honor to be here, and I'm very grateful for the invitation. I'd really like to extend my thanks, especially to Tara Fortune, not only for inviting me here to give the closing plenary, uh, but, but, but for having organized such a successful conference. I think it's been really great. So. OK, integrated language learning. Who needs a new term, right? Well, <clears throat> I use this term, integrated language learning, across the curriculum to really talk about one of the issues that has permeated this conference. And it has very much to do with the L1, L2 issue that has been discussed and debated. <clears throat> I hope to provide a new perspective on it, a different perspective. Uh, <clears throat> Integrated language learning, for me, is a term that I use to talk about biliteracy development. And specifically, it really refers to making L1 and L2 connections for the purpose of developing literacy in two languages. And also, uh, to diminish what uh, Jim Cummins calls the two solitudes approach, where both target languages are kept completely uh, separate. <clears throat> One of the reasons L1, L2 connections are considered to be helpful for developing biliteracy has to do with Cummins' model, which is a rather simple model, but I like it. I also like the model we saw yesterday of a tree, uh, but I'm going to stick to this uh, iceberg model where there's a common underlying proficiency <clears throat> where uh, concepts and skills related to language can transfer from one skill to another. And by reinforcing L1, to L1 and L2 connections, we really reinforce this common underlying proficiency. And I'm going to give you an example uh, from the research that I'm going to talk about today. <clears throat> uh, in one of the biliteracy projects that I'll be talking to you about, we focused on word formation. <clears throat> Uh, in other words, um, uh, prefixes, suffixes, and root words. So the notion of word formation is something that is really part of a learner's common underlying proficiency. If you know about word formation in one language and are learning a cognate language, you do not have to learn all over again the notion of word formation. But what you do need help with is more at the surface level in terms of which prefixes go with which language, which suffixes go with which language. And this is something that's very subject or language specific and has to be dealt with specifically by respective language teachers. <clears throat> so what is this L1, L2 dilemma? Uh, it's been phrased as a, framed as a debate. I call it a bit of a dilemma because if we know that there are cognitive benefits to uh, drawing on the first language in order to develop second language proficiency, if we know this for sure, then it is a bit of a dilemma because teachers need to uh, ensure massive exposure to the target language massive amounts of opportunities to use the target language uh, and therefore there are really good reasons for assigning a specific context to each language so that Spanish would be in the Spanish class and French would be in the French class and so on <clears throat> and teachers immersion teachers have worked really hard at doing this I just want to mention this didn't come up in the in the introduction but I was an immersion teacher in the 1980s, a French immersion teacher. And so in the research that I'm going to talk about, I draw a lot on some of my own teaching experience. <clears throat> and I was one of the ones that made sure that the French class, in French class, it was very, very much used for French. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the dilemma is how can teachers really encourage students to draw on their knowledge of both languages while developing a sense of the linguistic and contextual integrity of each language on its own. Okay? To me, that's the issue. 
uh, that we want to maintain the contextual integrity of each language, but we need to facilitate some sort of transfer from one language to the other. <clears throat> and what we've come up with, uh, with, my, with some of my colleagues and also my graduate students in the Montreal area, is this idea of using biliteracy tasks that cross boundaries between languages and that cross boundaries between languages. And what this involves is the partner teachers of both target languages collaborating. So that really um, the, the, the L1, L2 connection is really being done by partner teachers who are designing biliteracy tasks that cross languages and cross classes, but in each case, the target language remains the language of communication in each respective class. And I'm going to show you. And in the first year, we simply observed in the schools. We wanted to see what teachers and students were already doing about this mixture of languages, how they were responding to it. And what we found is that they weren't really responding to it. They were continuing as if it was a typical one-way French immersion, uh, yeah, one-way French immersion program. We found very few connections being made across languages, and we found no teachers, no French and English teachers that were collaborating. It just wasn't part of their culture. The one good example of collaboration we found was with one teacher who was teaching both the French and the English part of the day, and so she was collaborating with herself. <clears throat> it's true. This is very true. <clears throat> so. During this first year, we identified, <clears throat> we found six teachers who were willing to work with us on a project. So three pairs of teachers, the French and English teachers of three different groups of students. And we undertook the second year of our project, which was this bilingual read aloud project that I'm going to tell you about now. Uh, I just want to mention that in the first year, one thing we did observe was teachers often talking about primary level teachers, teachers often read aloud to their students. And so we thought this was an instructional technique that would be interesting to incorporate with a new twist, making it a bilingual read aloud project. So <clears throat> it sounds very simple, but actually it took a long time to get this going and to develop it. Um, it's a paper that's published in Language Awareness uh, by myself, Laura Collins, and Susan Ballinger, where <clears throat> The teachers uh, simply read the same chapter book aloud to their students, alternating between French and English. So that uh, the French teacher read chapter one in French and would ask the students to make predictions, but they wouldn't hear chapter two until the English class. In the English class, the teacher would ask the students to retell her the story, uh, what they had heard in chapter one, and then in English, and then she would proceed to read chapter two, and then chapter three would be in French. And each time, though, the teacher began the class by asking students to recount what had happened in the previous chapter, even though it had been read in the other language. So the purpose, or one of the purposes of this, one purpose was to get the teachers working together and collaborating, and the other purpose was to encourage peer scaffolding and peer interaction, right? Because the idea was that if the chap first chapter had been read in French, the francophones would be at an advantage. They probably understood more. But then they were being asked in the English class to retell the chapter in English. And so that puts the English-speaking children at an advantage. So the point was to watch the students interact and scaffold one another as they retold part of the story. Okay. Uh, so I just want to mention the books because they were the, the, this series is quite amazing, and I'm sure that many many teachers here know about the Magic Treehouse uh, series. It's written by a, a, an American, uh, Mary Pope Osborne. All all of these books are translated into French, and I believe that almost all of them are are, uh, are available in Spanish as well as other languages. I know that they are, are in Portuguese. They've been translated into many many languages. And I always like to point out that I'm actually not Mary Pope's, uh, Pope Osborne's manager, 
or anything like that. But this is a really, really interesting series because it's highly educational because the children always travel back in time and learn about a specific period. And at the same time, they also learn about different ways of writing over time. So one of the stories was, uh, it's called Vacation Under the Volcano, and they go back to the time of Pompeii and the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. They learn all sorts of things about uh, uh, Roman antiquity, and at the same time they learn that books were actually written on papyrus that were rolled into scrolls. Okay? Anyway, and the kids, the kids really, really like these books. <clears throat> And we have lots of data. We videotaped. They actually read three books over a four-month period. We videotaped all of the reading sessions. Uh, we have all of the data transcribed. We interviewed teachers. We interviewed students. Students completed a questionnaire. Uh, we have quite a bit of data from this particular study. <clears throat> so what I want to uh, show you, uh, I just want to give you an example of the kinds of interesting connections that were made just to show you the potential for this type of activity. So that <clears throat> at one point, they're learning about sundials. And this is a fairly new concept for some of these children, uh, how a sundial works and so on. So you can see the content that's interesting in these stories, right? And, and the stories actually cross uh, subject matter areas because some of these teachers, for example, uh, integrated this story about Pompeii into the unit on uh, natural disasters, for example. But in this short clip I'm going to show you, you'll see the connections that are being made between sundial and the word in French, which, which is cadran solaire. So you can see the word solar in there, right? Cadran solaire, <clears throat> because of the word soleil, which is in French. But in English, we also have the word solar. So you'll see some of the connections that are being You see the kind of connections that were, were being made. <clears throat> before I go on, I want to talk to you about some dis disconnections that were also made. <clears throat> uh, and before I do that, I, I just want to show you, because one of our concerns was, because it was kind of exploratory, we weren't sure how the children would react. We thought maybe, you know how sometimes children say, oh, well, that's, that's stupid, that's boring. We, we did that already in another class, right? And, and we didn't have those types of reactions. The, the, the children were really interested. Well, what was very interesting was that at the end, we interviewed, we did focus interviews with the children. And one of the questions we are always asked them was, what was the favorite part in some of these books, right? And so, of course, when it comes to Mount, Mount Vesuvius and the, the vacation under the volcano, so many of the children said that when the volcano erupted and the children had to escape from the volcano, this was really their favorite part of the book. And so Susan, my research uh, uh, assistant, uh, asked them what language that part of the book had been read to them in, right? <clears throat> so uh, there are four students that are, that are in this focus group, and one student says, I think it was French. Another one says, no, no, it was English. <clears throat> and a third one says, yeah, it was English. Uh, and the... Uh, uh, Susan asks two other children, that means that there were more than four here, uh, <laughs> two other children, what was your favorite part? And the same three children keep arguing, and I go, no, it was French. No, it was English. No, French. English. <clears throat> and she finally says, okay, there's some disagreement about whether it was English or French. That's okay. Susan's a wonderful person. <laughs> So what's interesting about that, what I, and th this is the part I wanted to relate back to the discussion we've been having at the conference about you know, the L1, L2 distinction. What I believe is that it's not all that distinct in the, mind, in the minds of young children and the minds of emergent bilinguals. I think the distinction is actually very fuzzy. And what I think, and I think it's worthy of further exploration, is the fact that there's, they're, they're encoding information in ways that is not language specific. It's more of a kind of mental ease. They're drawing on world knowledge. They're remembering the story. They understand the content, but the language, it's just not clear to them. So the good part about this is that what it means is this is why we can teach so much content to them in a language they don't yet know because they're grasping it anyway. The bad news is that they're not focusing on language in the same way that we think they are, right? <clears throat> Okay, so what really stood out, though, in this project was how much the children really liked this project, liked the project. 
Uh, we, we gave students a questionnaire. The majority of them ranked all three of the books as, you know, I loved this book. They loved all of the books. We asked them questions like, did you prefer having it read in English or French? And they said, well, it didn't really matter. And the other thing is, is that most of the students wanted to continue reading this series and went and invaded the school libraries, taking all of the books out so they could read them, regardless of which language it was in. And it's, so it's a project that seemed to, in many ways, validate both languages, you know. Uh, and it was, it was really about creating coherence across classes, okay? So the key here is coherence. And the reason I stress this is because I always like to recount this anecdote. During the begin first year of the project, I was with grade two children in their French class with the French teacher. And I decided to follow the children through their school day. So I followed these grade two children through their school day. And I was blown away. None of it made any sense to me. I don't know how they made sense of it. But we were in French. The language was French. They're doing one thing in French. The bell rang. And we went over to the next classroom. And all of a sudden, the language changed. And it was in English. And they were doing something completely different that didn't have anything to do with what they were just doing. So it seemed to me that. Uh, we're doing a disservice to students and if we're not creating some sort of coherence across the curriculum. And so to create the coherence, it involves the collaboration of partner teachers. And this time we decided to really focus on vocabulary. So we had a real linguistic focus. Okay. So just very quickly, why focus on vocabulary? There, is, there has been research done in, in immersion classrooms that really show that Teachers do focus on vocabulary, but it's always about the meaning of words, right? Because it's the vocabulary that drives the content teaching. So students end up learning a lot of difficult words that are related to, to, to content. But teachers very rarely did explicit vocabulary teaching in terms of the structure of words and how words are formed. Uh, whereas if you teach children, as you know, uh, word formation rules concerning prefixes, their vocabulary just doubles in size, right? Once you know that the, the prefix RE means that you do something over again, you suddenly can apply that to hundreds of other words, right? Uh, and so this was the uh, focus we decided to take. And some of this research had also said that cross-lingual strategies in teaching about word formation can be very beneficial. So uh, the point, though, is that when you focus on something like word formation, you want to contextualize it, right? So all of our work was contextualized in illustrated storybooks, OK? So the first project I talked about what involved chapter books, OK? The, sec the second project, the Tickle project, was done with younger children. The school district wanted us to do it with grade two teachers. So we didn't want to use chapter books, and we worked hard at finding really good illustrated, uh, well, illustrated storybooks or picture books. Year one, we did one by Phoebe Gilman called The Balloon Tree, and uh, one called The Three Robbers by Tommy Ungerer. I'm going to talk a little bit more about these. And Tommy Ungerer was such a success. Tommy Unger is a, is a European writer from Strasbourg. He's French, and he's a trilingual writer. Uh, he writes in English, French, and also German. <clears throat> okay, so now I want to give you a sense of the kinds of tasks that teachers, that, that the instruction to teachers was simply think of a task that you start in one language, but that continues in the other class. Not the same activity, but a, a literacy task that continues in the, in the other class. So here's an example. <clears throat> This is from the picture book, The Three Robbers. The three robbers at the beginning are really nasty, and they steal, and they rob, and they plunder. Uh, and they actually kidnap this little girl, T Tiffany. They take Tiffany back to, to their home. And when she's there, she realizes that they have this chest. They have chests just full of treasure. It's just full of treasure. They've never done anything with the money that they actually stole. So in French. The French teacher reads this and then stops at that point. It's really about halfway through the book. 
So it's this really key point. And she just stops and asks the children to make predictions. What do you think the three robbers are going to use their money for, right? So the children have all sorts of ideas about how you could use all of this treasure. And they're doing this in French. But it's not until the next class, the English class, where the teacher says, OK, so what, what, tell me what your predictions were now. I'm just going to show you this little clip, because the, the, this is the English teacher who's trying to pick up where the French teacher left off and turns it into a literacy task. OK, so you get the sense of the activity starting in one class and continuing in the next class. Now, within that context, though, we ask teachers to focus on language, right? And as I said, the language was on word formation. So because <clears throat> actually the happy part of the story is that what the three robbers decided to do was to take all their money and buy a big castle and then go out and look for all the unhappy abandoned children and let them live in this castle, right? And so this, this is a big part of the story, right? So they're going out to look for all the unhappy children so we really exploit that idea of happy versus unhappy, and teachers draw attention to all sorts of words that you could negate once you know that rule, right? So uh, unable comes from able, and unbelievable comes from believable. And in the French class, something similar is happening because in French, the negator um, prefix here is mal, malheureux, and the teacher is doing similar things, right? But very much in French, the English is, the teacher's doing this in English, the French teacher's doing it in French, to the extent that their students are able to take in this kind of information, and they make various games for students, you know, to create words and so on. I'm going to show you an example now, I think. I thought you might like a little movie break. It's called the prefixes. <clears throat> we had a really good group of teachers to work with. I'm not going to, so, and then in French, there was, there was always this idea of looking for the bigger, the smaller word and the bigger word, right? So uh, I'm not going to show this particular video. I want to move on a bit here, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, the word, uh, the verb terroriza, the, the teacher that really focuses on that, and the, some of the students are saying, oh, terror, I hear, I hear the word terror in that, and really getting them to look for small words and big words. <clears throat> okay, now... <clears throat> Moving on to Crichter, this, is the this was the best story. Crichter is a fascinating story about a woman who lives in Paris. Her name is Madame Badeau, and her son sends her a boa constrictor as a gift, OK? So she gets this boa constrictor. She does all sorts of things to adapt it to her home. And he becomes a remarkable person. He ends up going to school and showing the children. He forms himself into, he forms himself into letters and numbers to help them learn the letters and how to count. Uh, she, he uh, becomes a skipping rope for them to play with. Uh, and in the end, he actually saves Madame Badeau because her place is being burglarized, right? So he becomes a hero. And here you see that he's getting a medal. And in the story, we read, for his bravery, a nice medal was awarded to the heroic snake. So the theme that was built around this story is all about what it means to be courageous and brave and so on. So in this context, to have a linguistic focus, this is the kind of information that we gave the teachers during the workshops, right? So we take this theme of a hero and, and look at things like the fact that from that we can form the word heroism and heroic, uh, the word brave and bravery come up, the word courageous and courage come up. And then, to the extent, whoops, <clears throat> to the extent that was possible, and, and then also the French teacher though got similar information, right? Because these words are parallel words, so they're talking also about the fact that the the uh, the, the, the the snake is heroic and courageux and brave and so on. And then, <clears throat> to the extent that was possible with their students, the teachers would would show how these uh, suffixes, for example, here, heroic, the IC, once you know that, you can take a word like history and make the word historic, or you can take the word microscope and make the word microscopic, right? Or if we build on the, and, and, and similar things were being done in French, right? Because the pattern is very similar. Uh, in, in, in terms of uh, courage and courageous, they try to point out to students that you can, once you know that suffix, you can take a word like danger and make dangerous and so on. And uh, similar patterns exist in French, okay? But the extent to which teachers focus on this is really in the different classes. So that's a language focus. 
what the, te what the teachers really had to come up with was a task that started in one class and continued into another class. So I'm going to show you uh, one of the projects that two of the teachers designed around the theme of adaptation. Because remember I said that Madame Badeau, she really helped uh, Crichter adapt, right? She made him, she even knitted him a long scarf. She got him a long bed and brought in palm trees. And he really did a lot to adapt himself to the community by helping out the community, by helping the children. So these teachers decided to focus in on the theme of adaptations. And what they did was, uh, in the, in the uh, English class, well, basically they had a choice. They had to pick a, choose a pet. They could choose from a giraffe, an octopus, a porcupine, or a bat. They chose a pet, and they had to describe in the English class how they would adapt their home for their new pet but at the same time, in the French class, they had to talk about how that same pet would adapt itself to the community by being useful. And then the point here was that they came up with a, a bilingual book. Okay, so this is an example. Uh, so this is their, their creation from both French and English classes. Um, here you have, so this is the same student who's done this, right? You open the book. And on one side, you have that this student has chosen a giraffe. In English, he says, I'm going to choose a name. It's going to be Allison. And if it's a boy, I'm going to call him Max. For my pet, I am going to do a house with a tall ceiling. The tree is for the food for him or her. And then in French, about the same pet, she has a picture of the giraffe helping her do the dishes. And in French, she says, my giraffe has a long tongue, and so she's going to help me do the dishes with her long tongue. Uh, another child in English says, I'll bring him to the beach, and draws a picture of the beach and the giraffe. And on the other page in French, it says, I can slide down its back. Okay, That's how the giraffe can be useful for her. Um, just very quickly before I conclude, I want to point out that the teachers, because again, this was exploratory. We didn't, uh, we weren't sure if the kids would like hearing the same story or not. The teachers said that students loved it. They enjoyed making connections between languages. They never complained about hearing the same book. And they were very excited to hear it again in a different language. And <clears throat> at the last meeting with teachers, uh, I don't, I'm not going to show you this particular video, but we have the teachers there. And I said to them, too bad we don't yet have the test results, so we know how, well, how effective this was. And the teachers said, we don't need the test results because we can see how effective this was. And, the, they, they, and they're just saying, my students are just saying, oh, look, there's a small word and a bigger word. And they're, 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 even though this was second grade, they became very adept at identifying parts of words within the context of these stories. So, <clears throat> okay, so on that note, what I want to say is that the results here I've gone through over, I've gone over very, very quickly, and they're going to be published in a more refined way in the new journal that uh, C. Bjorklund and, and D. Tedek are uh, editing called Journal of Immersion and Content-Based Language Education, and the publication of this study should come out, and the, the first issue is set to come out early next year, and their second issue later next year. So on that note, I would like to thank you very, very much for your attention.